I'm Mitra Sorrells and I'm here in the Focuswire studio at Focusrite Europe and I am joined by Joost Auerkirk. He is co-founder and chief technology officer of Hopper. So let's talk, Hopper is an app, only an app, yes. launched about three years ago. Yes. And I heard you say on the stage this morning, you're up to a, more than 26 million downloads. Yes. That's pretty incredible. It is. Did you, could you ever have seen that coming? No. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it was a long time to get this far. Um, and we, uh, you know, we, we tried a lot of different things before we really had found that product market fit. But once it took off, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's been quite a ride. So I'm curious, um, can you talk at all about your customer acquisition strategies? Because I know you, you don't do Google ads. No. Um, you know, none of the kind of traditional methods, really. So right. how are you getting those people? So a lot of it is through social media. Um, so Facebook, Snapchat, um, Instagram, um, YouTube. And basically, it's trying to reach users to engage them on the value that Hopper can bring them instead of doing what a lot of our competitors are doing, which is trying to capture users that are at a very particular moment of being close to a transaction. And so we're interested in finding users that um, are much earlier in their trip planning process. Okay. Yeah, so talk a little bit about that. I know that you, you have people, people put in their desired destinations, maybe a time frame, and they're doing that months in advance, if I understand right. correctly. So what, what does that give you then, to have that data that so far in advance? So, well, what it gives the user is a better opportunity to get a good price, because uh, generally the more time you have in order to make that decision, uh, the better off you are. And Hopper can basically find the opportunities in that time window and seize them on behalf of the user. Um, but what it also gives our supplier partners is uh, a different kind of customer, a customer that is not so close to a transaction um, and that maybe um, has a, a different kind of profile for them, which makes it more interesting for them um, in terms of revenue management. And so you are now capturing this, this broad demand picture um, in real time. Talk to me a little bit about what you're learning by understanding the demand, because how does that then relate to the price prediction? So what it mostly relates, to, well, the price prediction basically is based on a history of um, prices that were found in the past and we basically can use that to model um, what is going to happen in the future. And the, we, get those, we get that data basically because it is generated by real users, whether our own users or uh, users of our GDS data partners. But basically, a price doesn't exist until somebody asks for it because it's an intersection of fares and availability status, et cetera. And so, it's important for us to have that stream of demand in order to build that history of um, data from which we can find patterns. But what it's also very interesting for, um, for users is that it enables us to um, find things that they aren't necessarily explicitly looking for in the sense that um, if you and I are both interested in um, Barcelona, and I am also interested in um, Copenhagen, there is a certain probability that you are also interested in Copenhagen. Um, or if I'm interested in these dates, it may also indicate by looking at our overall aggregate patterns, it may indicate that I am generally interested in a, you know, a winter vacation of a certain duration. And so what we can do is we can start making suggestions to users about things that they didn't necessarily explicitly ask for. And we discovered that that is in many ways more valuable to our users than finding the things that they had explicitly asked for. So 
So if I'm a Hopper user then, and I'm searching for this destination, but you know from all your data, hey, maybe she's interested in that, so then you're pushing that those notifications to me. Yes. And if I heard you correctly, you said about 25% of your bookings are coming from that AI-powered um, recommendation. Right. That's right. Yeah, that's, that's kind of interesting. And did I see the line was a sharp upturn on that in the last few months, Yeah, correct? so basically as we've been tuning the algorithms and as we've been able to uh, develop new kinds of insights and recommendations for people, um, we're really seeing, up, seeing an uptick in that. Um, and so, yeah, we're continuing to develop that more um, to improve those algorithms and to come up with new ones um, to, to the point where I believe that that may actually overtake the more explicit intent. And so the, how you interact with those recommendations as well helps personalize that over time. So if you don't interact with a certain kind of notification, then we will learn from that. We will say, okay, well that is not working for this particular user, and so let's try something else. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe right now there's a lot of that um, kind of setting filters or parameters no. is there. So is that something that you might look at in the future, for example, to be able to say, I only want to fly on Fridays, or I, you know, I, I definitely would want an aisle seat or a morning flight, or I mean, is, is there an interest in trying to create those more personalized opportunities? There is an interest, and the reason that we haven't done it um, too much to date is because of the complexity of predicting um, such a, a specific subset of intent, um, because there are only so many people that are exactly like you that you know want the Saturday departure um, only on these airlines, um, no longer than so many hours. And so it makes it more difficult for us to um, have enough data in order to actually make valuable recommendations. We have done it um, on things that like um, number of stops. We've done it on, um, we've built an exclusion for certain kinds of carriers that don't include um, baggage fees and uh, seat selection, for instance. So now I know last fall you started testing hotels in Hopper, yes. correct? And that's been rolling out a little bit more aggressively now in these last couple of months. That's right. What are, what are you learning there? What's happening there? Um, well, we're learning that it's very different from air in the sense that it's obviously not just about price. People are sensitive to price um, in hotels, but um, it's within a certain range of comfort. And what they're actually more sensitive to is a kind of quality of experience of what is my experience going to be like when I book this hotel, which we see much less in air, which is um, more or less a commodity. And so what we are working on um, is how do we develop what we have for air? Um, how do we extend that and evolve that for hotels by including these more qualitative um, dimensions. And is there a correlation there with people, are they booking air and hotel, or is it a completely different customer for you, are you finding? No, we are finding that there is a lot of overlap, and in fact, that, um, that, that one can drive the other. So um, what we're interested in, in the end, is helping people plan trips um, and to the extent that those trips will include both air and hotel at different times um, over the, you know, the course of the elapsed time before they actually uh, book. Um, and so, yeah, we're looking for opportunities on behalf of our customers that combine those things. And certainly for hotels, we're seeing a lot of that is being driven by um, our customers that are already planning flights. So as I'm thinking about this, you've got millions of people booking flights through Hopper. You're potentially on your way to having millions of people booking hotels through Hopper. Are you becoming an online travel agency or a mobile travel agency? I shouldn't say online, I, th I guess. I think we actually are one. Yeah. <laughs> and that's certainly not what we set out to do originally. So Fred and I are from Expedia and we knew the, um, the complexity and the operational um, uh, difficulty of operating an OTA of, of supporting customers in that way. 
Um, but it became clear relatively early on with the mobile app that um, having a model where we are not in fact the agent, but rather where we are referring traffic, um, that the user experience for that um, was, was not at all acceptable. And so for it to actually be fluid, um, it became clear that we had to become in fact, effectively an OTA. And so our company, as we grow now, is growing as much in the product development and the technology as it is in the operational, the customer support, the ticketing agents, all of that. So if I happen to see you here at Focusrite Europe next year, then what might we hear from you? What might Hopper be doing a year from now? I think you're going to hear a lot more about hotels. I think you're going to hear about a lot more about um, the AI technologies that I talked about in my presentation today and how we've evolved those um, specifically for hotels. Um, and I think you're going to hear a lot more people talking about uh, what you just mentioned, which is Hopper as the mobile OTA. Okay. Well, we'll leave it at that. Yos, thank you so much thank for you. your time. Appreciate it. And thank you for watching.